Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the 9-11 Memorial and Museum. My name is Noah Rauch. I'm the Senior Vice President for Education and Public Programs here. I want to um, welcome all of our museum members. I see many familiar faces. And to everyone tuning into our live web broadcast. We are joined tonight by Dr. Sajan Gohel, International Security Director for the Asia Pacific Foundation. He's also the editor for NATO's first ever counterterrorism reference curriculum and serves as a visiting lecturer at the London School of Economics and Political Science. In his upcoming book, Dr. Teacher Terrorist, The Life and Legacy of Al-Qaeda Leader Ayman al-Zawahiri, Dr. Gohel provides the first definitive account of the successor to Osama bin Laden as head of Al-Qaeda and one of the world's most wanted terrorists until he was killed by a US drone strike in July of 2022. The book is set to be published later this month on November 28th. Tonight, in conversation with museum director Clifford Channon, he will discuss the life of al-Zawahiri, his deadly legacy, and the history and future of al-Qaeda. So with that, please join me in welcoming our speaker, Dr. Sajan Gohel, in conversation with Cliff Channon. Thank you, Noah, and welcome, everybody. Um, this seems a particularly timely program in ways that we hadn't anticipated when we first heard about the book. Um, it really digs in, in a way, to the life of somebody who we've all heard about, but I think for many years he was obscured by Osama bin Laden and who Zawahiri was and what he contributed, in quotes, to this movement is really very well laid out in Dr. Gohel's book. So we're gonna talk about all of these issues as they came forward, but welcome Dr. Gohel. I, I think as a place to start, let's begin with the birth of Ayman al-Zawahiri in 1951, in and around Cairo is where he lived his early years, but he came from a very distinguished lineage in both his maternal and paternal sides and his family was at the pinnacle in many ways of the various Egyptian elites that were running the country at that point. So if you would frame his youth and his family impact and influence on who he became. Sure, certainly. Well, firstly, let me just say thank you, Cliff, for the very kind invitation to, to speak here and to, to all your team for, for making me so welcome. So Ayman al-Zawari has a very interesting background, as you were uh, alluding to. This is somebody who comes from an elite background, not just on one side of his family, but both sides, his maternal side, his paternal side. On his father's side, they come from a, a background of scholars, of uh, religious figures. Uh, he had relatives that were in the Al-Azhar Seminary, which is one of the most prestigious Islamic seminaries in the world. One of his, uh, his, his, his relatives was at one time the, the Grand Imam, the Grand Mufti of uh, Al-Azhar. On his mother's side, equally prestigious. Uh, they were uh, connected to being physicians. Uh, they were also involved in politics. Uh, one of his relatives was the first ever Secretary General of the Arab League. Um, one of his uncles was also a very prominent uh, defense lawyer uh, and was involved in some of the most prominent cases that attracted a national attention. So he had people that had significant influence, power, prestige, and the ability to actually shape uh, politics inside uh, Egypt. And that went through several generations. And he grew up with knowing that legacy. Now, he himself was uh, a dedicated, very good student. He ultimately became a doctor. Uh, but his engagement with these radical ideas began very early. And it came, and you write about this, how the two strands of his family lineage sort of combine, whether it's the pan-Arab nationalism on the Arab League side of the family, or the Islamic revivalism, or the extremely rigorous Muslim identity on the Al-Azhar side of the family. These two things nonetheless had in common the idea that the West was this pernicious influence, and whether it was through a secular or religious path, Egypt, the Arab world, the Muslim world, needed somehow to break free from this dominance. Yes, so there were two narratives that were shaping his thinking. One was that the West had subjugated Egypt, that Egypt had lost its independence, that it was being controlled 
by countries like uh, the United States. But perhaps at the time of his, gr of his youth, his biggest issue, gripe, grievance was actually with the Egyptian state, what he deemed to be apostates, non-believers, uh, particularly critical of uh, people like uh, Gamal al-Nasser, who was seen as such an important secular leader of Egypt, who led the pan-Arab nationalist movement uh, in Egypt in the 50s and 60s. And where I think it was interesting in particular was uh, that one of Ayman al-Zawari's maternal relatives was the uncle of uh, the Egyptian ideologue Said Qutb. Most people won't necessarily know who Said Qutb is, but he's extremely important when you want to look at any form of uh, jihadist thinking because Said Qutb's notoriety was that he had actually spent time in the United States in the late 40s, especially in Greeley, Colorado, and where he basically condemned the West for its immorality uh, and for its uh, moral decay and corruption. And he was heralded by many jihadists for many generations afterwards. And he was eventually executed by the Egyptian state for plotting against them. His book, Milestones, gained huge uh, attention. And interestingly, Ayman al-Zawari's uncle happened to be the lawyer of uh, Said Qutb. So his uncle brought in that thinking to uh, Ayman al-Zawari about the West, about Egypt, about apostasy, about infidels, uh, and he saw it firsthand. And in many ways, he felt that he was taking on the mantle uh, that had been passed to him. And he had this legacy, not just from his family history, but an ideological legacy of Egyptian militancy that he had a responsibility to continue at a very young age. So you uh, quote freely from um, Zawahari's writings, and he was very prolific. We'll talk about that. But you know, he characterizes Said Qutb as the most prominent theoretician of the fundamentalist movements, which was, in his terms, very high praise. Um, Qutb, again, becomes this marker for subsequent generations of Islamist jihadists. Um, and uh, Zawahri is honoring that legacy. Yet at the same time, he himself is beginning to engage, even as a teenager, in, in, in his high school years, he's beginning to engage in underground quasi-violent activities, or at least leading based on violence in a direction. And at some point, even with his medical training and a medical practice, he becomes involved in groups around the assassination of Anwar Sadat, the president of Egypt. How did that happen? Now, what was his role? And how formative was this? Because he wound up spending three years in prison out of all of that time. So it's very important, the 1970s, because uh, at that point, uh, Anwar Sadat had taken over from Nasser, and he decided to go on a different path uh, to Nasser, where Nasser was very much pro-Soviet. He had the socialist policies. Uh, Sadat had decided that the, it was better to form a relationship with the United States. He was also the first Muslim leader to recognize uh, the state of Israel. The other thing he did was he started releasing a lot of the jihadists who had been put in prison by uh, Nasser. And what you saw was that a lot of ideas were now being shared on university campuses uh, where extremist narratives were growing. And Ayman al-Zawari was actually one of the first to cut his teeth in militancy against the state. At a very young age, and is still in his teen years, he had plotted, uh, he was involved in a plot to take over a military college uh, in, in Egypt. Now the plot failed, and most of the conspirators were arrested and executed. He actually managed to get off because of his family connections, so he was kind of forgiven. But his, his ideological strain continued to grow. He then was connected to the Al-Jihad terrorist group, which was responsible for killing uh, Egyptian President Anwar Sadat. What I think is significant about that is that he was not necessarily key and pivotal to the assassination, but he was on the periphery of various different follow-up plots. He was arrested detained, imprisoned, and from being seen as a secondary figure, he actually became the main face. He was seen on video uh, in the prisons, uh, protesting, speaking in English, 
being very uh, charismatic and provocative at the same time. And you could see how all the different prisoners would heed what he was saying. He would make a statement, they would then chant, and he, it would go back and forth. So from being on the periphery, he was able to use his ideological knowledge, his rhetoric, uh, and his ability to convey information, both in Arabic and English, made him the face of the movement, even though he hadn't actually been directly behind the assassination of Sadat. And that showed his ability to uh, actually capitalize on a situation. He was an opportunist. He was not necessarily the most skilled ideologue, but he was very good at being in the right place at the right time and taking advantage of it and taking credit for it as well. The film of him in the courtroom making a declaration on behalf of all the defendants, which we have an excerpt of down in the museum, um, that became a rallying point. That, I suppose, was the first time he becomes this public face of the movement. And from what you write, it seems he liked very much that role. He saw himself as a leader, whatever his flaws might have been. He was attracted to the idea that he would be leading this movement. And in his writings then and subsequently, and Al-Qaeda itself saw itself this way, he advocated on behalf of a vanguard of you know, the people who were in an early stage of the revolution, the far-seeing ones who would lead it. And he saw himself certainly in that light. Very much so. And as you say, he, he, he enjoyed it. Uh, he, he reveled in it. It was something that he saw as his opportunity to take the Egyptian uh, jihadist movement forward under the guise that he wanted to present. That didn't mean that it was gonna be plain sailing because he faced challenges. There were others within the uh, uh, Egyptian jihadist movement that actually challenged him, that disagreed with him, that uh, sometimes over ego or personality direction, they wanted to have a slightly different path. Uh, but he wasn't willing to give up. He was very determined that he would then be the individual to take the legacy on from Said Qutb. He goes in the mid 80s to uh, Pakistan, Afghanistan, in terms of the ongoing war between the Afghans and the Soviets. He's going ostensibly to provide medical services for refugees and such. But he also wants and gets exposure to the jihad. And this becomes a very important credential for him. He seeks this out. But this also marks for him the separation from Egypt at a certain point around then because of his notoriety, because he'd already been in prison, he doesn't get home ever again, does he? He doesn't. And um, as you rightly mentioned, he gets released from prison. He spends some three years in prison for various uh, activities to do with the Al-Jihad group connected to the Sadat assassination. Egypt releases him. They release a lot of people in the hope that they will just disappear into obscurity somewhere. And they think, OK, it's a good idea. If they want to go to Afghanistan, Pakistan, let them go. They'll probably die in their battle against the, the Soviets. And for him, this was now a very important opportunity to further get his message out, because Afghanistan and Pakistan had become the center now for various different individuals from around the Islamic world congregating to fight against the uh, Soviets uh, who were occupying Afghanistan. And Ayman al-Zawari felt that this could be a great opportunity to get his Egyptian agenda out there, to get potential supporters. He wasn't necessarily fighting on the front line against the Soviets. He was again being more tactical and strategic. His goal was to actually get people to rally to his cause, to get benefactors, supporters, individuals that would actually provide the backing that he needed to get his Egyptian project off the ground. And of course, one person in particular that was of most importance that would provide a relationship of real consequence was he came into contact with Osama bin Laden. So they meet in the Afghan theater um, in this mid-late 80s period. Um, they have not identical, but they both have visions of this global movement. They have some differences. And here, the question of the near enemy versus the far enemy becomes paramount. At that point, Zawahiri is still focused on Egypt. He's not. Bin Laden has this vision of 
the, U the U.S. and the Western powers manipulating these apostate rulers. But in Egypt, Sawari then believes that's really where the focus needs to be. So at some point, they have to come to a meeting of the minds on this. But talk about the early days of that relationship. What did each bring to the other? And what was the organizational strength that each had relative to one another? Well, at the time, uh, Osama bin Laden was uh, somebody who was uh, effectively going through a transformation himself because he also came from a very elite family. His family is very well known uh, as one of the most successful um, families in, in Saudi Arabia. They're involved in construction and many different forms of business. He actually had a very secular uh, upbringing and at some point uh, in his 20s, he began to become far more religious and he felt that there was a calling to go to uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan and, and fight the Soviets. So in some ways, the similarity that they already had was their backgrounds, that they came from very privileged backgrounds, but they had decided to give that up. They had decided to fight in, in what they thought was a noble cause against an ungodly enemy. Uh, so they had that already in common. And they, they seem to also uh, develop ideas as to what a global jihadist movement could look like post the Soviet uh, defeat from Afghanistan. They were discussing about what was the primary goal thereafter. And in particular, where it seemed that there was some commonality is that they wanted to focus on the near enemy, which was against apostate regimes, so-called apostate regimes like those in uh, Egypt and other parts of the Middle East and, and North Africa. So they had perhaps a shared goal as well. And also they uh, seem to uh, come together on various other controversial issues. So at that time, Osama bin Laden had a relationship with another very well-known ideologue, uh, Abdullah Azam, a Jordanian-Palestinian, who uh, was far more uh, versed in uh, the Islamic uh, theology on, uh, on, 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 on the history of things that were important. But there was a controversy because Abdullah Azam wanted to take the Arab Mujahideen after the Soviets were defeated and go to war against Israel. Uh, at that time, Israel was deemed as the far enemy. So there was a difference. There was a fault line that was emerging. And this is where, again, Ayman al-Zawari's uh, cunning and plotting came in because he worked very hard to undermine Abdullah Azam, discredit him, label him as corrupt, stealing funds from money that Osama bin Laden was providing. And over time, he was able to demonize uh, Abdullah Azam in the minds of bin Laden. Mysteriously, then Abd Abdullah Azam dies and it leaves open the project for bin Laden and Ayman al-Zawari to continue. So you say mysteriously, but in the book, you enter into this idea that he was involved in the assassination of Abdullah Azam. So tell us a little bit about that, because you also note that he had roles in a, new, a number of assassinations. This was something that he served very well, his cause, by organizing. Yes. Yeah, so Ayman al-Zawari was the type of individual that felt that if there was somebody that was a problem, an opposition, a block, somebody that would interfere in what his agenda was going to be, the best option would be to eliminate them. And Abdullah Azam died in a car explosion in the Pakistani city of Peshawar. Uh, and there was always these rumors as to who potentially was responsible for killing him. Was it the KGB seeking revenge for their defeat uh, in Afghanistan? Was it uh, Israel because they were concerned that Az Azam was wanting to take the war to Israel itself? And the other person that gets mentioned is Ayman al-Zawari. And I think where it's particularly interesting is that many, many years later, uh, when Ayman al-Zawari would actually do a Q&A session online with people, and he would ask them that you can put any questions you want to me, feel free. The one question that kept being repeated by other jihadists is why did you kill Abdullah Azam? There was always this belief that he was responsible for actually uh, orchestrating that. And in many ways, it makes the most sense because Azam was that stumbling block in what Ayman al-Zawari wanted to 
uh, achieve. And he benefited the most with Azam being removed. So bin Laden and Zawahiri become joined in this cause. Uh, they combine their efforts, although uh, bin Laden still has Al Qaeda as it emerges, and Zawahiri is still running the Egyptian Islamic Jihad. They do not combine until later. Um, what did each bring to the relationship and the partnership in terms of the strengths and the weaknesses that they each had? Well, with bin Laden, his money was one of the most key uh, assets uh, in that. He was also charismatic. He had that ability to appeal to various different entities, and he was able to bring many different individuals from across the Arab world to be part of what was becoming known as, as al-Qaeda. In the case of Ayman al-Zawari, he already had a ready-made terrorist group, which was Egyptian Islamic Jihad, his faction that had split from uh, the al gama al Islamiyah, which uh, was that division that formed in prison when they were all in jail for the assassination of Anwar Sadat. And Ayman al-Zawari also had very skilled uh, operators, people that could carry out uh, targeted assassinations, uh, IED bombings, uh, all kinds of uh, arrays of, of terrorist uh, plotting and planning. So you had charisma and money from uh, bin Laden's side, and you had the operational capabilities from uh, Ayman al-Zawari's side. And those two uh, worked in tandem in many ways. They uh, would collaborate um, on, on various plots, targeting US troops that were briefly stationed in Yemen, the targeting of US troops uh, in, in Somalia, uh, and, and then subsequently there have been a whole spate of plots that they had collaborated on, including, of course, the 1998 U.S. embassy bombings and, and USS Cole. So as you write, uh, Zwahiri was a key operational figure in these events. And so, you know, we have a tendency, I think, to think of bin Laden as kind of the mastermind of all of this. And I don't think we have as clear an understanding of Zawahiri's role in actually organizing and carrying out these kinds of events. And so is that nonetheless a fair characterization that bin Laden sort of had the oversight guidance role and then Zawahiri sort of implemented the plans? It was in many ways exactly that. Uh, very often we will see that Osama bin Laden gets the most attention. He was the head of Al Qaeda. He was the face uh, of Al Qaeda, but there were many different cogs involved in terms of plotting and planning. And often, Ayman al-Zawari would be the one that would do the actual specific delegating of tasks. He was very good at finding the, the right people to do very bad things, uh, including the bombings, including the assassinations. Uh, and bin Laden would trust him. There was a massive amount of trust between both of them uh, and that collaboration where they would work together on ideas of who to kill, who to target, what mass casualty plot could be successful, what ones would be harder to do, how to take the conflict further from the confines of Afghanistan, Pakistan, right across to East Africa, to uh, the Middle East, uh, to North Africa. This was something that they had agreed on. And there was that effective division of labor that made them that deadly force. So tell us a little about the sourcing for this, because you really do go into great detail about his movements, but also his thinking and the emergence of his view of the world. Now, as I said before, he was a very prolific writer. And uh, some of the books he put out uh, had enormous influence, including what was essentially a training manual for terrorists that was referred to as the Al-Qaeda handbook, but this was his handy work. Um, how did you source this? You're, in, you're really in the weeds in his life and you know, doesn't seem immediately accessible. So how do you put the picture together of particularly when he's not a young man with following in Egypt and a family, he's in the wilds of Afghanistan and yet you're still following him? So interesting question. It was uh, challenging. Uh, this wasn't a book I could uh, say I produced overnight. It took, <laughs> it took well over a decade uh, to put different pieces together. And it was very much a stop-start affair because I couldn't always get the information I wanted to. It took a huge amount of 
pursuing people and uh, who were engaged specifically in counterterrorism, whose job it was to monitor Al Qaeda, that had bits of information that were very important when it came to specific operational uh, plotting and planning. And very often they wouldn't want to have that conversation. Uh, but uh, one thing I learned is uh, be persistent uh, and be polite whilst you're being persistent. So if and when you get that opportunity, hopefully that person will warm to you and, and be more uh, engaging. And that was one thing that I needed because yes, Ayman al-Zawari was very prolific in writing. So you already had what he was saying. Uh, and there were already people had written some articles and books on Al-Qaeda, identifying some of the plots. But what I wanted to, to do was to look more at the minutia as to the roles and the activities of specific people. And it kept becoming clearer. The more I was talking to people, the more I was getting inputs, background, that Ayman al-Zawari was very important in that. So every time someone would uh, have a conversation with me about Ayman al-Zawari, it would actually lead to more questions. Mm -hmm. It would lead me to go into different paths, paths that I didn't actually realize were, were there, but suddenly they'd been presented to me. So then it was a, a, a challenge that, okay, I need to then get those sources verified, that I can't just go by what one person has said. I'm gonna have to get them backed up. And over time, I was able to, to achieve that. It was painful, but actually it was probably the most rewarding part of the book was to be able to get things confirmed by multiple people. Mm. Now, we talked a little bit before, and um, you, know, you picked a, a fascinating, but nonetheless fairly obscure focus on this man and on the movement in general, but it goes back to you watching 9-11 happen, your involvement in the subject matter. So yes, 9-11 um, uh, had significant impact on, on my future direction. I saw the second plane hit the South Tower, uh, the World Trade Center, and you see the terrible tragedy that is unfolding and how lives are going to be changed forever. The worst terrorist attack that has ever happened to this date. Uh, and the thing I was looking at was that, well, there were many things that were occurring to me. One in particular was that behind the violence, behind the sheer hatred, one thing we needed to understand more was the ideological message because behind the, the attack, there's a message there's an agenda. And I wanted to understand much more about what the doctrine is, what the ideological message is, and how that shapes uh, a terrorist group's position, and how they use that to indoctrinate and radicalize and recruit uh, other people. So it was very important from that moment. The other thing that I thought was critically important was that it was essential to try and find a, a solution to saving Afghanistan. Because the reason why 9-11 happened was Afghanistan had become a, a cesspool for extremism. It was the hub for Al Qaeda, and it was where they could plot attacks. And tied to that was the fact that under the Taliban, Afghanistan had become a state that supported misogyny, that suppressed the rights of women. And the thing that I have concluded and I'm very adamant about even now is that wherever you see the rise of misogyny and it being supported, whether it was Afghanistan in the 1980s uh, and 1990s or ISIS in Iraq and Syria post-Arab Spring or Afghanistan right now, wherever you see the rise of misogyny, you will see terrorism and extremism also emerge. Mm -hmm. So, so many different things were coming into play when I saw uh, the attack uh, on, 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 the, on the World Trade Center, and these two specific aspects, understanding the ideology and countering misogyny were the most important. So let's talk about the 9-11 attack. Um, Bin Laden is set on doing this. Uh, Zawahiri is still separate from Al-Qaeda in the sense that he is still running his own organization. And there is opposition within his organization to the 9-11 attack. They don't want the attention that they expect the United States will pay to them after the attack in the, in the US. So Wahari has a moment where he has to make a choice whether or not he's going to stick with his group 
or whether or not he's going to cast his lot with bin Laden. He makes a very fateful choice. And also, in the lead up to this, he's given a critical assignment in relation to the 9-11 attack, though I think you do write about him knowing of it, but not knowing necessarily the operational details. So place for us Zawahiri in relation to the planning for and the carrying out of the 9-11 attack. So many people have, have written that Ayman al-Zawahiri wasn't necessarily critical to the particular operation that would result in the attacks on the United States on September 11th, 2001. And I don't entirely disagree uh, with that. His role wasn't to specifically be part of that plot. It was the previous plot, the precursor to 9-11, as I call it, which was the targeted assassination of the leader of the Northern Alliance, Ahmed Shah Massoud. The Northern Alliance was a critical ally to the West at the time because they were the bulwark against the Taliban. The Taliban had not been able to take over all of Afghanistan. They were being held back by Ahmed Shah Massoud's Northern Alliance, who was a legendary uh, Mujahideen leader who had fought against uh, the Soviets. So the thinking was that in order for 9-11 to be successful, you had to eliminate one of the key allies of the West in Afghanistan, because that would then, in theory for Al-Qaeda, result in the collapse of the Northern Alliance, and it would make the American ability to carry out a response much harder because they would have no allies on the ground. So Ayman al zawari was specifically tasked by bin Laden a year before 9-11 to start plotting the attack. And Ahmed Shah Massoud was killed two days before 9-11. In my uh, humble opinion, I don't think 9-11 could have happened if Ahmed Shah Massoud had not been assassinated. He was absolutely essential to the Al-Qaeda plot. And as much as we talk about 9-11, I think we also need to talk about 9-9. And the other thing is, as you mentioned- 9-9 was the assassination of right. Masood. Right, 9-9 was the assassination of Masood. And the, the other thing you mentioned was the challenges that Zawari faced internally, because many people within his own Egyptian uh, faction were against the 9-11 attacks, because they had no problem in targeting the US in, say, Kenya and Tanzania with the 1998 embassy bombings, or the USS Cole off the, the, the coast of Yemen. There was no uh, love for America, there was strong hatred, but the argument that they had was that if you target the US mainland, they will come to Afghanistan, we will lose our operational base, we will lose our central command. Right now, everything is good. You can still carry out attacks against the West in the Middle East, in Asia and Africa, and you won't be uh, targeted. But if you specifically go after the US, it changes the dynamics completely. And Ayman al-Zawari was in a dilemma because on the one hand, he had to be responsible to his Egyptian Qaeda. On the other hand, he had to be very loyal to Osama bin Laden because of that very long-standing relationship. And ultimately, fatefully, as you mentioned, he decided to side with uh, bin Laden, which actually did result in some uh, fault lines which, uh, with his other Egyptian uh, faction. They were, some of them went off on their own and in their own sort of, I guess, with his blessing to go off and do whatever they would do. Um, pick up now the American response. They are, uh, Al-Qaeda is wrong about the collapse of the Northern Alliance. The Northern Alliance is bolstered by the U.S. intelligence and military, and then the military comes in. Uh, by the end of the year, Bin Laden and Zawahiri are trapped in the Tora Bora Mountains. We all know this story. And oddly enough, he's finishing a book at this point in time. And the book turns out to be kind of his last will and testament. Now, he happened to live another 20 years, but he saw the book as the conclusion of his jihadi life. The book is called Knights Under the Prophet's Banner. And it really is a statement of determination that the fight must continue. I'm going to quote from it. I apologize for quoting from him. He says, this book has been written as a warning to the forces of evil that lie in wait for this nation, meaning the Muslim nation. We tell them the nation is drawing closer every day to victory over you and is about to inflict its rightful punishment on you. Your battle against this nation is destined to lead to inevitable defeat for yourselves. 
So it's a rather bold statement to make given the circumstances he was in, but it's also a real reflection of a commitment to something that didn't end when his life ended. And this is really where the sort of the ideological fervor and the depth of the fanaticism really comes into full exposure. In all of these circumstances, after everything that's happened, including the loss of his own family in, in other uh, parts of the military campaign, he restates this for posterity and urging people to follow in the footsteps that he had set out on. Yes, so Knights on the Prophet's Banner was very much meant to be, as you said, his last will and testament. It was meant to be a blueprint for future jihadists to take on because he expected to die. He had already lost one of his wives, several of his children uh, with the U.S. bombing campaign, which ultimately was the consequence of him supporting uh, Osama bin Laden. And what he wanted was to lay out a plan which was to guide individuals to not give up targeting the West. So even though he had that reluctance uh, in the 9-11 uh, operation, he had felt that now that Al-Qaeda had committed itself to targeting the U.S., it could not give up that idea. It would have to continue to uh, pursue it. And he spoke about various things that needed to be demonstrated. So one thing was getting the narrative out, controlling the media, being able to get the narrative of what Al-Qaeda wanted to say unhindered and unfiltered, uh, because it was very important to communicate to audiences very specific messaging. The other thing was also for individuals to uh, grow and develop their own infrastructure, their own cadres, their own funding streams, their own ability uh, to operate. Uh, and the one thing that he constantly wanted to sort of have as an underlying factor was the Egyptian history of jihadism, that that had to be the source of, the, of what they needed to all follow. Track him for us. We know they get out of the Torbora Mountains. Uh, they go their separate ways, bin Laden and Zawahiri, in part as an operational matter so that the leadership of the organization would not be found in the same place. Follow bin, uh, we've, we have followed in other contexts bin Laden. Follow Zawahiri for us. Where does he go? His, his security uh, procedures seemed even more stringent than bin Laden's over time. He was the longest surviving of any of them. Uh, what happens? Where does he go? How does he live? Uh, what are his preoccupations in this hidden life? What's really interesting about that is that we know he ends up in Pakistan with all the Al-Qaeda leadership, but there are differences in where they end up. Uh, bin Laden eventually settles in Abbottabad, which everybody knows, and it's right next to uh, an urban center of Pakistan. It's right next to the Pakistani military academy. Uh, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, who was one of the master planners of 9-11, is found in a military cantonment in Rawalpindi. Uh, you had people like uh, Ramzi bin Al-Shiba, Tafik bin Atash, found in, in Karachi. These are major urban centers that Al-Qaeda had embedded themselves in inside Pakistan. And in many ways, U.S. counterterrorism agencies had done a brilliant job in being able to unearth them and uncover them. And, and uh, either bring them to justice or, or, or eliminate them. In the case of Ayman al-Zawari, no one actually knows where he had act ended up in Pakistan. There is a belief that he had chosen to stay within the tribal areas of Pakistan, what was previously known as the federally administered tribal areas, where he was being protected specifically by entities close to uh, the Taliban as well as some Pakistani jihadist groups like the Jeshi Mohammed or the lashkar e -Toyba. So he had chosen a different location, and that's perhaps why he was never ever found or caught in Pakistan, even though on several occasions, the US did get very close to launching an operation or a drone operation, and they missed him by a matter of minutes. Mm. That tended to be because they had alerted the Pakistani authorities in the hope that they could assist. And then, uh, perhaps unsurprisingly, uh, Zawari gets the tip off by the same people that are supposed to be helping the US, and he escapes. Well, this is one of the subtexts in your book, is uh, particularly in this post-9-11 period, where the US and Pakistan are supposed to be allies in the fight, 
Uh, but the Pakistanis acting out of their own interests and a good deal of cultivation of various jihadi groups are at the very least playing a double game, if even that much. I think one of the, the biggest mistakes uh, post 9-11 was for the Bush administration to trust the Pakistani military leadership of General Pervez Musharraf to be the solution, whereas in many ways they were part of the problem. Remember that pre 9-11, there were only three countries that recognized uh, the Taliban regime in Afghanistan, and one of them was Pakistan. Pakistan's uh, goal at the time had been to uh, create strategic depth in Afghanistan to prevent the Pashtun nationalist movement. It also used it as, as an opportunity to create further tensions in uh, Indian administered Kashmir with the insurgency uh, there. So Pakistan had these very murky ties with various jihadist and terrorist groups. And many of those in turn had those strong relationships with, uh, uh, with, with Al-Qaeda. Now, the biggest indictment of that whole approach, if you think about it, was where was Osama bin Laden found? He was found in Abbottabad, uh, not somewhere in the, in the middle of the tribal areas. He was v literally a stone's throw from Pakistan's military academy, as we were just discussing. So unfortunately, the Pakistani military has played a double game throughout the war on terrorism, where they took a lot of money for, from the US they said the right things, and then they did what they wanted uh, afterwards. And that was something that uh, Pervez Musharraf's uh, legacy ultimately will be. And even the subsequent generals and civilian leaders of Pakistan uh, haven't been very genuine in their commitment. They will talk about their sacrifices and how many people they may have lost, but it's all very uh, cleverly articulated because the people they lost in the war on terrorism tended to be uh, against the entities that they had actually provoked in the first place. Mm -hmm. So uh, bin Laden is in hiding and they are separate. And as you describe it, Zawahiri becomes the de facto leader of Al Qaeda. The plots that emanate from Al Qaeda, the London bombing, a number of other incidents, are actually organized out of Zawahiri's world rather than bin Laden's. So at this point, we get to see what really the capacities are and what he is able to, uh, to mobilize in pursuit of his goal. You see a, a, a part of that being the continuation of his, uh, his book that he was writing whilst the bombs were going off, Nights Under the Prophet's Banner, where he spoke about the need to continue now the mission in targeting the West. Going after the United States had proved to be difficult post 9-11. So, one thing that they were looking at was specifically seeing if they could go after allies of the US, in particular the United Kingdom. Between 2002 and 2007, there were a series of Al-Qaeda plots that were aimed to keep targeting the United States, uh, sorry, the United Kingdom again and again. The 7-7 bombings, which were the attacks uh, on, on London on the 7th of July 2005, which saw three suicide bombers targeting three buses and one suicide, sorry, three suicide bombers targeting three trains and one suicide bomber targeting a, a bus was the most successful one because the others had been disrupted. But there were other plots that actually have had massive impact on our daily lives, which don't get enough appreciation. So for example, the uh, airline liquid bomb plot, which was potentially comparable to 9-11, which was the plan to blow up several transatlantic flights going from the UK to the US and Canada and sequentially blown up. That was a very uh, uh, well-constructed plot, but thankfully the US and the UK authorities were able to disrupt it. But there's still that legacy because everybody here, uh, yourself, Cliff as well, when we travel, uh, we have to uh, take those see-through bags and 100 mil bottles. Mm -hmm. That's a, a legacy of one of Ayman al zawahris plots. So, you know, in reading through the book, he makes many ideological <laughs> statements. I mean, in many ways, uh, the core message is the continuity of the struggle. And for him, 
the focus of where this should manifest itself may change, whether it's Egypt or Israel or the United States, but that consistency of message is clear all the way through his life. And I'm moving ahead to the current moment because we talked about this. I mean, you think about Hamas and its ideology. Now, Hamas is very much in a self-declared struggle against Israel, and we saw what happened on October 7th, but their ideology is very similar to the kinds of things that Zawahiri and other of the jihadi theologians and philosophers have, have put forward over the years. And I wonder if you could draw out the comparisons or the differences between the ideological statements that these organizations make and the motivations that they have to continue no matter what, including the sacrifice of many of their own people. Well, the Palestinian issue has always been a, a talking point for Al-Qaeda. Virtually every statement, whether it was by Osama bin Laden or Ayman al-Zawari and other members of Al-Qaeda will always talk about the Palestinian issue, but they never directly engaged in the conflict itself, partly because uh, they were focusing on other entities, whether it was Mubarak in Egypt or the West, the United States, the, the United Kingdom itself. There were some ideological similarities between Hamas and, and Al-Qaeda, even though Hamas has never been affiliated with Al-Qaeda, its uh, operations perhaps, its tactics, its strategies, does have those eerie similarities. There are uh, a historically ideological connection in the sense that Hamas originates from the uh, Palestinian Muslim Brotherhood, uh, where and Ayman al-Zawari's Egyptian Islamic Jihad originates uh, from a tangential way from the Egy uh, Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood, even though he disavowed the Brotherhood, he's criticized them for wanting to go into mainstream politics, uh, he has not uh, been very praiseworthy of them, there is that potential connection. Where there are separations is that Al-Qaeda didn't directly engage in the conflict between Israel uh, and, and, and Hamas. They, in many ways, stayed away, but they used the propaganda. They would talk about the violence. They would talk about uh, the collateral damage. They would see if they could get their oxygen or publicity from it mm. without actually being directly involved. And before Ayman al-Zawari's uh, uh, death, he was very active in talking about uh, thing, uh, issues such as how some Arab countries were beginning to recognize mm -hmm. the state of Israel, and he was very critical of it, and he was warning uh, about it. It's interesting also in the aftermath of the uh, 7th of October uh, 2023 Hamas uh, operation in Israel, that Al-Qaeda and its affiliates have been very vocal in supporting Hamas. So again, you see them trying to take advantage of the situation, hoping to gain mileage from it. So we're going to turn over a couple of questions in the audience in a moment, but I want to get to, and if I can call it this, Zawahiri's legacy, because you do attribute certain of the policies, and I would call them insights of the jihadist movement more generally, to initiatives he took. And I'll list a number of them, you can add them, but just to sort of summarize why he had the impact he had. His recognition early on, on the importance of whatever the latest communications technology was to spread the message. So you start speaking about facts, which seems antediluvian, but you know, you go from faxes to VHS, to audio tapes, to the internet, and all of these things, and he was riding that wave as a way of getting the message out. You talk also about the importance he saw in having a freestanding base, Afghanistan being the best example, but a place where the jihadi groups could be in relative safety, they could plan their, their, their attacks, they could train cadres of people, and this was also something that was important to him. The recruitment in Western countries of sympathetic people to carry out attacks on their own in these countries is also something that he was one of the uh, early adapters of. I may be missing some more, but the point is, much of what we see in terms of how the jihadi movements think of organizing themselves does seem to go back to some of the earliest uh, in, uh, um, insights, we'll call them, that he brought to the problem he was trying to solve of organizing these kinds of movements. 
Yes, and the example of uh, communications to get the messaging out is, is a very important one because, as you mentioned, fax machines may be seen as somewhat outdated uh, today, but he was the first terrorist that actually thought that this is a good way to uh, instantaneously communicate to the world that they were plotting and planning attacks. He was the first to utilize the internet uh, to see how that that could be uh, able to enhance Al-Qaeda's direct communications with, with the world. At some times they were stuck having to give video cassettes to news agencies and then if those news agencies wanted to edit it down, the messaging was being diluted. So he wanted to use the internet specifically to ensure that their communications were unfiltered, they were direct, they were immediate, and they could uh, galvanize and motivate people uh, around the world. He was fascinated with modern communications. Uh, he had a relative that worked as a stringer for the uh, ABC News in the late 70s. And from that, he developed an understanding of how media, technology, and conveying the message could all come together for his, for his agenda. Very keen also to ensure Al-Qaeda's preservation, I think was his other uh, legacy. He saw ISIS uh, in many ways usurp Al-Qaeda to grow, to become uh, a, a more of a dangerous entity. They burnt brightly and then they burnt out equally quickly. And he didn't want Al-Qaeda to go the way of ISIS. Al-Qaeda already suffered a lot of hits with its senior leadership being arrested, captured, or killed, including with Osama bin Laden. So in many ways, he was happy for ISIS to take the limelight, to get the attention from US counterterrorism agencies. His goal was for Al-Qaeda to quietly regrow, not just in Afghanistan and Pakistan, but the affiliates. And he promoted this safe bases idea, which was to uh, work within their communities, uh, marry locally, uh, develop their own funding streams, create their own uh, cadres, be self-sufficient so that they weren't necessarily uh, dependent on each other. So I think those were, were two of the, the very key uh, goals that he wanted. And also the relationship with the Taliban, I think has been perhaps the most important uh, legacy. Uh, the Taliban are the entity that have protected Al-Qaeda pre 9-11 post 9-11 and in the aftermath of them retaking uh, Afghanistan. And that was very much down to the relationship that Ayman al-Zawari had cultivated, in particular with one faction of the Taliban, which is known as the Haqqani Network, who control all the key portfolios in the current regime today. So he was able to develop relationships even whilst he was in hiding, uh, and he was still able to get his message across. Of course, over time, the older he got, the longer winded he became. He wasn't as charismatic as he had been in, in his youth. But I think his endurance, his ability to constantly uh, counter anybody to challenge him was perhaps one of his other important legacies. He was not necessarily the most skilled ideologue. He wasn't necessarily the most violent in terms of people like uh, Abu Musab al-Zarqawi, who would behead people uh, on camera for Al-Qaeda in Iraq. But what he was, was he was able to survive. He was a survivor, he was smart, he was cunning, uh, and he w played the long game. He believed in strategic patience. So I think all of these were in many ways um, his legacy, and he's left a blueprint, unfortunately, for Al-Qaeda and for future generations of jihadists that they can perhaps develop further. Although he may have over relied a little bit on his safety in Afghanistan, since that is where he ultimately met his demise at the hands or the uh, at the at a, a U.S. drone strike. Yeah. And where was he found? He was found in Shepur district in Kabul, which is the embassy district. It's also where all the ill-gotten gains through uh, uh, Afghanistan's. Uh, corruption, drug trafficking, where people would build these very um, uh, opulent houses, uh, very garish, uh, not necessarily very discreet uh, in many ways. They, they, they stood out like a sore thumb. Uh, and 
It's interesting that for an individual who prioritized his security, as you mentioned, someone who was so guarded, so careful, that he chose to come back and in many ways not hide anymore. He was there in the open for the U.S. to, to identify, and he was kept in a safe house by the Haqqani network. Stones throw away from the Taliban Ministry of Vice and Virtue, what I call the misogyny ministry, because its job is to specifically undermine the rights of women. Stones throw away from the Taliban's general director of intelligence, their intelligence agency. So you could see how close he was being kept by the Taliban. And I would also say very close proximity to the US embassy, although it's not being used right now. Uh, it's worth remembering that if the West ever reestablishes its ties with the Taliban, and they retake those embassies, their neighbors are going to be people like uh, of Osama bin Laden and Ayman al-Zawari's mm. allies, mm. members of Al-Qaeda, other jihadist groups. So it's a sobering thought to think about that the people that protected Al-Qaeda pre-9-11, took them to Pakistan post-9-11, are now back in power inside uh, Afghanistan. And I think that I think is, is, is very um, disconcerting. Let's see if we can get a question or two from our audience. Please raise your hand and uh, wait for a microphone. The gentleman here, your mic is coming. This is probably an unanswerable question, but given the current situation, uh, Hamas, Al Qaeda, Hezbollah, with these organizations having the avowed purpose of destroying Israel, is there any off-ramp for either side? Yeah, that, that is certainly a very challenging question. Uh, I, I think that the opportunity for an off-ramp uh, does not exist right now. I think we are heading into a very, very troubling and challenging situation uh, that is continuing to, to grow and manifest. Uh, the Israeli operation in uh, Gaza will continue. You will see uh, entities wanting to uh, exploit it, uh, tied to Hamas, tied to Hezbollah. Also go further, look at the Houthis in Yemen who are launching missile strikes or trying to target uh, the, to the state of Israel. We are also seeing uh, Shia militia groups in uh, Iraq and Syria launching attacks on U.S. bases in both countries. The situation is beginning to, to spiral. We are also seeing major social tensions uh, emerge in major Western cities, in New York, in London, in Paris, uh, in, in Munich. Uh, so the problem is already growing. Uh, and I think the chances of an off-ramp perhaps were, were never really there. Uh, when you look at the Hamas's operation and how devastating and horrific it was in terms of what it did and who it targeted, uh, not just uh, civilians, but children, uh, and also people that weren't even uh, Israelis. Uh, Thai nationals, Nepalese nationals were killed in the Hamas operation. Uh, I think Hamas thought this through long in advance. They knew that this would result in an aggressive Israeli uh, operation. Uh, they had planned for it. Uh, so I wish there is an off-ramp. And if someone can find it, it would be really good to bring that forward right now before this situation continues to, to spiral. I am deeply concerned about how hate has grown so quickly in a very short space of time. I have never seen it like this. Uh, I don't recall it being like this post 9-11. I don't recall seeing it in the aftermath of the Arab Spring going wrong. Uh, so there's a lot of worrying signs there, sir. Thank you. Other questions? Can't leave it on that note, folks. Something else? <laughs> well, you've given us a lot to think about. And uh, Could I say one thing? I think you, you can, yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, I just want to, to acknowledge everybody who 
uh, was directly impacted by the September 11th uh, attacks. I want to specifically mention a good friend here, Mary Fetchett, uh, whose uh, wonderful son, Brad, was killed in the South Tower. Um, the reason why I do what I do is the legacy of what 9-11 uh, had, had created. Uh, I, uh, I find it very um, emotional to be here because this is where my career began. It was here. This is hallowed ground. This is sacred ground. Uh, and that's why I dedicated my book partly to the victims and the families that were impacted by 9-11 and also to the women of Afghanistan because I see the two interconnected. Uh, they are all victims of, of an ideological movement that wishes to create hate. Uh, and I have been totally inspired by people like uh, Mary and the work she's done to help uh, survivors and people that have been impacted by terrorism. I have been inspired by the first responders in New York and the sacrifices they have made, the challenges they face, the health challenges they've faced. Uh, and I think it, every time I've had moments of doubt in writing my book, uh, and it was across 10 years, I had many doubts. I kept taking courage from a lot of the good people in New York and, and the work they did. So if it wasn't for them, I don't think I would have finished this. Well, thank you. It's very well said. And it's an important book. It will be out soon. And uh, we've just scratched the surface of it. I will tell you for insights into uh, the motivation of a essentially lifelong career based on the very hatred you're describing. And really getting inside of that and understanding the motivation and the dedication that this is not something that is a matter of a weeks or months or even years commitment. This is a commitment that transcends generations for people who believe in this. And so the warning implicit in the book is also one of the most important messages it conveys. So with that, I'm going to ask you to thank with me Dr. Sajan Gohel for coming and touching the world.